everyone. I'm Dina. And I'm Charlotte. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. Hello. Hello, hello. How has your weekend been? It's Sunday today. I have the uh, Sunday scaries a wee bit. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But uh, you know what? I went to a coin show yesterday. Yes, you were telling me. That sounds so interesting. I love it. Honestly, coins are fucking fun. I don't know if we have any uh, folks who like coins listening to the podcast, but if you don't, you should get into it. I don't know if it's like just like a me in my 30s kind of thing that I'm going <laughs> down this path, but it is wholesome. It is fun, and uh, I'm digging it. I love that. I have just been vegetating at home for most of the weekend, playing a lot of video games as per usual, and I have gotten back into Doom lately. I've mentioned that before, but... Yeah. Uh, Slaying the demons is making me feeling, oh my goodness, making me feeling, (laughs) is making me feel a little better about the state of the world, I think. I feel that. I um I am very impatiently waiting. Stardew Valley is dropping their next big update in a few days, and I am so excited. Oh my god, I haven't played Stardew in ages, and honestly, such a wholesome game. It's one I jump back into once in a while and it it's so great every time honestly it's cheaper than therapy so i just kind of keep it going (laughs) oh my god i feel that hard (laughs) especially uh considering from the sounds of it the stories we have for you guys today are pretty dark in nature i've got one that goes all the way across the other side of the world and one that hits really close to home for dina and i Uh, Because it happened in a little town just outside of Edmonton, where we're from. I'm excited. I've got a uh, wild murder for hire story. Ooh. I've got a Luca Magnata update that's just going to annoy the fuck out of you. Oh, boo. There Uh, seems to have been a lot of those lately. I know. I don't like it. And this is one where, like, we're starting to see as time goes on the justice system doing its thing, and I'm not super stoked about it. Uh, But we do have a listener email, and then we're going to top it off with our strange and unusual death. So I'm pretty excited for today, even though it is going to be a little terrible. Well, brace yourselves, folks. Um, (laughs) So yeah, if you're from the Edmonton area, I was actually really surprised that I hadn't heard about this. A co-worker was telling me, uh, she lives in Beaumont, Alberta, that just a couple of blocks down from her, a pretty horrific crime took place. And I, my jaw was on the floor when she told me. I'm eager to hear this. I don't know anything about this. Unfortunately, this is a story about the death of Teresa Lynn Oberly. She was a Beaumont resident, and unfortunately, she was murdered by her boyfriend and the father of her child. After he had murdered her, he took her body to his father's house where he kept her in the garage for a couple of days before letting his dad know that she was there. Oh. His dad was a retired butcher and he helped the boyfriend dismember her and burn her and dispose of her remains. No. Oh, I hate that really freaking tragic and sad. She would have been turning 41 just recently. Apparently, she was an angel on this earth. And it's, yeah, incredibly sad. The boyfriend, Kenneth Skelly, was 43 years old, and he was charged with second degree murder in relation to her death. And his dad was charged with defiling a body, basically, as he should be. But he was given something like 12 months house arrest with a curfew to happen afterwards. No jail time for dismembering her body and, uh, yeah, defiling her corpse. Awful. Holy shit. How long ago was this? This happened in July of 2023, so last summer. Oh, my God. This kind of ties into the story I have for you, which I hate. But, like... Just leave your fucking partner. Oh, my God. We see it time and time again. What is it with guys and just 
not being able to accept divorce or accept a breakup. Just fucking let it go. Is it Move really on. worth it? And then you dragged your father into it too? My God. And you know, the worst thing is you said like the father was notified that the body was in the garage and immediately my thought goes to like how disappointed you would be as a parent to find out that your kid killed their partner and had their body in your garage. But then the fact that he helped, like what is this family? The first thing you would do in theory is call the police, be like, yeah, yeah, son. Uh, okay, not a problem. And then you call the police <laughs> is what you do. Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, you know, something snapped with your with your child and you got to do the right thing. And this guy did not. Oh, my God. I hate that. I wish nothing but love and peace to her family. I looked her up real quick, and apparently her family is from Delaware. As of the time that the article that I found was written, they didn't have the funds to go and visit her for the funeral, and so they were trying to raise money to do that. A murder is always senseless, but this to me is just, that's so sad. Oh, my God. No kidding. That's, yeah, incredibly tragic, but close to home. I hate it. I hate you know what I hate all of these stories. I I love I love what we do, but I hate what we talk about. If that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. I have a strange fascination with how humans behave and why they do the things they do because they are so incredibly senseless. And I think there's a part of me that really struggles to understand it. Like you say, it's incredibly senseless. There's no reason for this. I really think it's one of those things that you're never going to understand it because you're not fucking evil. You know what I mean? Like it's mm -hmm. it, it, it's not going to make sense because it you can't I'm going to quote Dr. Phil. Uh, you can't <laughs> make sense out of nonsense. You yeah. know, like to the normal human brain, we're never going to understand why someone would behave in such a way. But uh, this guy's a fucking piece of shit and he's uh, one of our neighbors, apparently. So uh, I hate this guy. You can spend all the time in prison, my friend. Goodbye. And unfortunately, knowing our justice system, he probably won't. All right. So my story is unfortunately kind of similar to yours, and I hate that. Oh, no. This is actually going on right now. An ex-Missouri principal admitted to a murder-for-hire plot of a teacher who was pregnant with his child. Oh, good Lord. So this is from the New York Post. Basically, what happened was a New York principal who was the former principal of Carr Lane Visual and Performing Arts Middle School in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, admitted that he hired a hitman to kill a teacher that he was having an affair with after discovering that she was pregnant with his child. My God. Now, obviously murder for hire he had to pay the hitman so he used twenty five hundred dollars to pay for this guy who ultimately killed this poor woman who we'll get to in a moment and he used school funds to pay <gasps> for the murder holy shit the audacity oh my god yeah so first of all twenty five hundred dollars to kill somebody does that not seem low it seems very low but I guess if desperate times, desperate measures? I guess. So this happened in 2016, and he is now in court. He pled guilty last week to one count of murder for hire and one count of conspiracy to commit murder for hire uh, for the killing of Jocelyn Peters, a third grade teacher. Wow. So that actually took quite a long time to kind of come to fruition, hey? It really did. I mean, this was quite a while ago, but he is due in court uh, the day after we record, so March the 11th. So it really did take quite a while for this to go through, which is surprising. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened was he had started a romantic relationship with her while he was married to another woman in late 2015. Boy. And she very quickly became pregnant with his child. He enlisted the help of a childhood friend named... Oh, my God. Right? I mean, your buddy that you grew up with, you're like, hey, man, I need your help. Jesus. So this friend is a dirtbag by the name of Philip J. Cutler, who he hired in February of 2016 to kill her because he knew that the pregnancy could jeopardize his marriage and possibly his career. 
Oh, for fuck's sakes. So on the 29th of that year, he sent him a text message asking him to come from Oklahoma to Missouri at the end of March. And uh, there's text message uh, records where the other guy said, okay, that's going to work. You're going to be sending the package. And uh, he spelled package P-A-C-G-E. Okay. And so he paid him $2,500. And they're saying again that he allegedly stole the money from the middle school. And not only that, but he sent him this money in this package. And he used the address of the school as the return address. Oh, my God. What an idiot. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're never smart when it comes to murder for hire. No kidding. The day after he got this money, he traveled from St. Louis to Oklahoma, and he stayed at the principal's house. Oh, God. And so Cornelius left the following day on a train to Chicago so that he would have an alibi. (laughs) Philip Cutler, the brilliant hitman that he hired, used Green's car, which he drove to her apartment, and used a key that he had given her to enter her home. He shot her with a 38 caliber firearm in the head, and he used a potato as a silencer to muffle the sound of the shot while she was sleeping. Up, uh, oh my god. I this is mind-blowing. This is some like I Uh, feel like they're playing at being mobsters or something. I know, and I hate them both so much for it. So she was 27 weeks pregnant when she died. Oh, God. And she, I, you know what? We're we're never going to talk poorly about a victim. We're going to talk poorly about perpetrators and murderers every single day, of course. Mm -hmm. But she just looked like the sweetest woman, and it's so, so sad. So... What happened was after she was murdered, he purchased a train ticket back so that there would be a verification that he was in Chicago at the time of the murder. He went to her apartment and called 911 to report that uh, she had been shot. And he was pretending that he had no idea what happened. Everything was terrible. However, video surveillance near the apartment caught his car on the street and uh, that it was around the time of the murder. So they saw this guy on camera. Not only that, they had his location on on his phone, which (laughs) said that the guy had been at her apartment. He is going to be appearing in court, like I said, on March 11th. Green himself is going to be appearing in court on June 5th for his sentencing. Uh, They are both pleading not guilty to all charges. Um, Fuck them both. Oh my God, be fucking for real. Not guilty. Are you serious, guys? Bitch, you're on camera. Fuck all the way off. Right to the top of fuck off mountain. (laughs) Right, and then I hope you fall off the mountain, you piece of (laughs) shit. Oh my god. I hope so badly that they get exactly what they deserve. You know, it made me think because we very recently covered an execution from Alabama. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't necessarily believe in the death penalty. If you're going to kill a pregnant woman because you don't want people to find out that you got her pregnant, um, I hope you die. That is the lowest of the fucking low and uh, rotten pieces is all I have to say. (laughs) Yep. So we'll keep you posted on their trial. Again, I hope that they have the absolute uh, brunt of the law smashed into their dirty, stupid, ugly faces. It's senseless. It's unnecessary as murders always are. But something about this one, it's just it's so, so sad. Like I said in the last story, leave your wife. Just leave. Leave. Yes. It's so much easier and it ends usually with nobody in jail. Exactly. Or dead. Exactly. Just, you know, divorce is a an option. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I've been divorced. I've been down that street. It sucks. But you know what? I'd do it again and again if I had to, if it meant I wasn't going to have to fucking kill somebody. 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. My God. Oh. <sighs> Now we're going to head across the other side of the world from where we are in Canada. We're heading to Japan, as we have so many times before. This was a pretty new case to me, which was a surprise because it's a fairly recent one. The Kyoto animation arson attack happened in 2019. 
I do not remember hearing of this at the time at all. Do you remember it? So I hadn't heard about this while it was happening, but I heard about it on another podcast very recently. And I'm also shocked that this wasn't all over the news because this is horrifying. Yeah, it's one of the worst mass attacks, mass murders, in fact, in Japanese history since World War II, which is crazy considering we talked about the sarin gas subway attacks, which killed 13. The Kyoto Animation Studio arson attack unfortunately saw 36 deaths and 32 more seriously injured, including the man who did it himself. Shinji Aoba. Shinji had a bone to pick with this particular animation studio because he was absolutely convinced that they had plagiarized his own work and he wasn't being taken too seriously when he was kind of talking about it. Like you do, he took some cans of gasoline, about 40 liters of gasoline or petrol for those of you in other parts of the world, and he doused the area inside the office building and set it on fire. He doused the area and several employees. While doing so, he did actually set himself on fire, and he also suffered severe burns. He got away, but he was apprehended by police about 100 meters from the building, like suffering serious burns. He wasn't able to be charged until about 10 months after the attack because he was still healing in hospital. He had third degree burns pretty much all over his body. I hope he fucking suffered every second. Absolutely. What he did was atrocious. Like I said, the death count of this particular arson was 36. That is unbelievable. His lawyers tried to protect him with the sort of mental illness argument, but it was pretty definitive by the prosecution that he had been in his right mind while planning it, and he has recently been sentenced to death. It's really interesting to me to see this parallel between our justice system versus the justice system in another country like Japan, obviously, for example. They don't fuck around. He was sentenced very recently. That's why it's kind of come back into the news. Like I said, the original fire did happen in 2019. It was revealed shortly after the fire that a majority of the victims had succumbed to burns rather than carbon monoxide poisoning, which is usually what happens. You die of smoke inhalation, right? Oh, my God. But but yes, I mean, we've talked about it before because it's kind of the morbid nature of the subject matter of the podcast. But burning to death is not a way I would want to go. That's for damn sure. His death is going to be nothing compared to the torture that he inflicted on those people. I mean, really. I think it will be very short and to the point. And I believe in Japan, when it comes to execution, inmates are not aware of an impending date. It will just happen one day. I believe they get something like 24 hours notice. They're allowed to kind of write their last words, etc., etc. And then it just happens. That's it. It's not particularly publicized, which... Depending on your stance on execution, it's it has been widely criticized. Japan and the US are the only countries in, I believe, the G8 countries that allow execution. Really? But uh, yeah, so Shinji Aoba, born May 16th, 1978, will probably see his end sometime soon. And that's that's it. I've heard that they, again, because they don't know when it's going to happen, there isn't really a huge chance for any kind of appeals or anything like that. So unlike in the States, they have it done pretty damn quick. Yeah, in the States, it can drag out for years or even decades mm-hmm. in some cases. But yeah, in Japan, you don't really get the option. Honestly, I feel like today's episode is um a whole lot of just really awful, awful news. And um, (laughs) fuck this guy too. All of these people. I mean, we don't talk about good people on this show, but like these guys are just terrible. 
No kidding. I think today might be uh, maybe a little cathartic if you're feeling down in the dumps. Sometimes it's nice to listen to other sad material, I suppose. But yeah, sorry if we kind of ruin your day with this episode, guys. My next story here is about one of my least favorite criminals in the world, and that is shitbag extraordinaire Luca Magnata. Boo, what a fucking shithead. Oh my god, punchable faces. He holds probably like spot number three of people in existence. I fucking hate this guy. Yep, absolute worst of the worst scum of the earth. So Luca Magnata, I'm going to talk about what he did in a moment here for those of you who aren't familiar. He has been officially transferred from a maximum security prison to a medium security institution. We talked about this a while ago that it was going to happen, but uh, it has happened. So he is serving a life sentence and uh, now he's in medium security. Oh my god, I hate to hear this kind of shit. And again, it's something we've been hearing a lot recently, especially in Canadian news, and it makes me kind of angry, especially knowing that a life sentence here isn't what you might think it is. No, and unfortunately, I'm going to talk about this in a moment here, but he will eventually be free, and I hate that. That makes my skin crawl. So Luca Magnata, uh, he originally started everything by posting videos online of him suffocating kittens and torturing cats. Piece of fucking shit. Oh, my God. And then he created the now infamous one killer, one ice pick online murder video. It honestly makes my stomach churn. So this guy, for those of you who don't know, he is definition narcissist, absolutely, to the nines. He basically created this, like, fake fan base online of himself where Wild. He, like, he acted like he was this famous model and uh, that he was doing all of this gay porn and he had all these fans and people loved him. He was also in the news not too long ago for allegedly dating notorious serial killer Carla Hamolka. Oh, shit. It all comes full circle. It really does. So all of this kind of started really bubbling up to the surface in spring of 2012, which was a horribly long time ago. I don't want to think about that. That seems like (laughs) to me, but that was a long time ago. So on May 22nd of 2012, surveillance video showed a man called Jun Lin going into his apartment in Montreal one evening and never coming out. Magnata, however, was seen coming and going from the apartment in the following days, and he left for Paris, and as he left for Paris, a janitor found a dismembered torso in a trashed suitcase, and this was around the same time that a human foot was mailed to the Conservative Party with a note saying that he would kill again. He also mailed a hand to the Liberal Party. Does he think he's living in, like, Hannibal Lecter's universe? I don't understand this, the, like, pomposity of all this. Right, and the thing is, he is one of those killers that clearly he just wanted to be famous for killing somebody. That's how I see him, is he did all of this outrageous stuff so that his name would be known. And unfortunately, it kind of worked because we're fucking talking about the guy. But Yeah, true enough. But we're going to say a bunch of bad stuff about him. So we don't think you're fucking brilliant, Magnata. You suck, for the record. I am not saying this guy is smart by any means. No. By May 30th of that year, Montreal police, they realized that he was the prime suspect and Interpol added him on their watch list. And a week later, he was found in an internet cafe in Berlin. And at that time, Vancouver schools were receiving packages as well, including a hand and a foot. But luckily, no students actually saw those contents. However, unfortunately, other people did. Oh, that's fucking horrible. But I do, I remember learning about this and uh, I think we were actually in like biology class or something and I remember talking about this with uh, a teacher. (laughs) 
Yeah. And that's interesting because I'm going to talk about something regarding a teacher after this. <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, but Jun Lin, his family came to Canada from China for the trial. Uh, they saw the verdict. They had 66 witnesses and a ton of online and physical evidence was presented. He admitted to the killing, but he pleaded not guilty to all charges. What? And he was found guilty on all counts, including first degree murder. And he was sentenced to life in prison, which again in Canada means that you are not eligible for parole for up to 25 years. But that means that he will be eligible for parole when that time is up. <sighs> womp womp. So the Correctional Service of Canada, they're not saying where he was transferred to. So we don't really know where he is. I'm uh, sure the information will come out sooner or oh, later. Oh, it definitely will. So he met the criteria back in 2022, and uh, he is now in a facility. They're saying it has a well-defined perimeter. It has high fences. It's strictly guarded, and it's patrolled by armed officers. But again, this means that he is going to be getting more freedom, which a man like this does not deserve. No, absolutely not. Lock the motherfucker up and throw away the key. They're saying, and this is again from the Correctional Service of Canada, that in Canada, our correctional system is fundamentally based on the rehabilitation of offenders, even if some remain incarcerated for the rest of their lives. This is our legislated mandate. We are constantly balancing many factors, including public safety risks, safe, secure, and humane treatment and victim rights. In accordance with policy, CSC must review an inmate security classification at least every two years for medium and maximum security inmates, and we must place inmates in the corresponding institutions. Oh, man. Just because he's playing nice inside doesn't mean he's fucking reformed. Oh, absolutely. And so he is going to be eligible for day parole on June 4th, 2034, and Ugh. for full parole on June 4th, 2037. So it's a little ways away, but still, this guy sucks. And if you don't know how badly this guy sucks, I highly recommend watching the documentary called Don't Fuck With Cats. It's on Netflix. It is horrific. I'm going to warn you. I've only seen it once and I will never watch it again. Yep. I have also seen it just once and it is fucking heartbreaking, but it's amazing to see how people came together to get this motherfucker. And an interesting note about the documentary that I found while looking into um, this news about him is, and this just happened, a school district in Metro Vancouver is investigating a complaint that a high school teacher showed students the documentary, and uh, it really upset everybody. I mean, oh, that's that's a tough case. Do I think that traumatizing kind of stuff should be shown in school? Do I think it's an education? Yes, absolutely. But wow. You know what? In grade eight, and I don't know why this happened even to this day. I really hate that I ever had to see this. But in grade eight, we had to watch a video of a lady giving birth for health class. I've heard horror stories from other people about this kind of stuff. I thankfully either missed it or was never like mandated to see it. I fucking cried. And it will stick with me, and it has given me a fear of childbirth ever since. So I can't even imagine seeing something like this. Uh, so basically what happened was the school received an anonymous letter from a parent saying that their kid came home crying and upset to the point of being hysterical and vomiting. And this was on the last day of school before Christmas break. <sighs> Oh, dear. So you've seen the documentary, right? I have, yes. Okay, so it's a three-part series for those of you who don't know. Um, it has a lot of footage of some of the videos that he made, both including um, what he did to Jun Lin, as well as the things that he did to animals. It is a difficult, difficult watch. The second episode of the series, it shows images of another video that Magnata had put on YouTube where he put a blindfold on him, he bound him, and then he murdered Jun Lin. And uh, they talk a lot about the mailing of the body parts as well. Now, I know a lot of people talk about like, oh, kids these days, they're too sensitive, blah, blah, blah. But like, there's a fucking line. And I think personally, I don't know how you feel about this, Charlotte, but I think they crossed it. I would be pretty upset if my kid came home and was traumatized. 
I think there is a time and a place and consent is a big thing. And I don't think those kids necessarily consented to see that sort of thing. Yeah, there was a child psychologist that talked about this and she said that it's natural to be traumatized by something like this, but it's not always inappropriate as long as there's a reason for watching it and it's followed up by a discussion, which there really wasn't a discussion after this. They kind of just watched it and everyone got really upset. Um, I was actually just thinking where this would slide into any particular subject. Like, does this fall under social studies or English or like, where does this fall? Right. I don't really see the point of why people should watch something like this, especially again, without consent, without some kind of a letter being sent out to parents being like, hey, your kids are going to watch this. If you're not okay with it, they can go into the other room. Um, There isn't really a ton of educational value in something like this. And uh, these kids were upset. And I think about that because these are kids that are, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old. I watched this as a grown adult who knew what I was getting into, who watches stuff like this pretty often. And that Mm -hmm. documentary upset me to the point where I'm never going to watch it again. Can't say it's one I'll be reaching for anytime soon. Was it fantastic? Absolutely. It was very well done. Yes. But it is not for the faint of heart and uh, it is very heavy material. So definitely take that into consideration if you're thinking about watching it. And if you have watched it before, I'm sure you'll agree with us. Yeah. And you know what? True crime isn't for everyone. I have people in my life who are like, I'm really excited about what you do. I'm excited about the podcast, but I just can't listen because this kind of stuff upsets me. And when people say that, I'm like, dude, I get it. Yeah, absolutely. I've had very, very similar conversations with friends and family members. My mom, for one, she said one night, like she was like, oh, I I lit some candles and she's like, I was going to listen to your podcast. And she's like, you got into the story. And she was like, nope, can't do this. Turned it off, put on some nice music. And I was like, I get it. I absolutely get it. It's not for everybody. And that's fine. And that's why I think something like this, I mean, that's like if you took any average person and you made them listen to like an episode about like Pee Wee Gaskins or something horrific like that, the average person is not going to like that. If you're someone like us who enjoys learning about that kind of thing, you are not the norm. I mean, for a long time, I did uh, special effects makeup. And at the time, I particularly loved gory wounds and burns and all sorts of stuff. And the more realistic I could make it, the better, right? And I would post my work on Instagram and whatnot. And I actually had a friend reach out to me and said, hey, I have to unfollow you. And he's like, it's nothing personal. He's like, I love you dearly. But he's like, I can't watch, like, I can't see this. It turns my stomach. And I was like, no worries at all. It's not for everybody. I understand. You know, I hope they're okay. You know, they're they're gonna recover. I mean, obviously, they're not traumatized for life or anything like that. They, I mean, people, you'll you'll get over this kind of thing, I think. But it's just a shitty thing to have to go through as a young child in school when, you know, you don't necessarily have the ability to get up and walk away. Most kids aren't going to just get up and leave. They're kind of forced to sit there and watch it. And again, if you haven't seen this documentary, you might think this isn't really a big deal, but it's a rough one. It's probably one of the most difficult true crime documentaries that I've seen in a long time because it touches on obviously the horrific crimes that he committed against this young man, but also the terrible human being that he was. Again, there's footage of him torturing animals. There's footage of him torturing Jun Lin. It's it's awful. It's not your typical day of the teacher rolling in the TV on the car and thinking, oh my God, it's going to be Bill Nye the Science Guy, or it's going to be Schoolhouse fucking Rock or whatever. Right? No, it's going to be a very heavy topic, traumatizing material, right? You're not necessarily prepared for that. And that's okay. Yeah, so I don't know what's going to become of this. I I mean, it sucks. It's difficult. Again, like I said, people complain that kids nowadays are too sensitive and that kind of thing. And uh, I don't think this is the kind of thing that the average person should watch and just be able to brush off. I suppose all that to say is we hope Luca Magnata is not getting out anytime soon. I really hope this 
uh, move to a medium security is not a reflection of leniency against him. And, uh, well, I suppose we'll have to hold our breath until, what, 2034, whatever it was? Yeah, we'll see what happens. And I mean, maybe in 2034, you and I are going to be big time podcasters and we'll talk about it. (laughs) So I received a very interesting email from our dear friend Cosplay Bug Yeg on Instagram about a story that we covered and I wanted to share it with you. Ooh, yes, please. And this is in regards to Robert Picton. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, I'm interested. So when we covered Robert Picton, one of the things that we talked about was that is very close to home for us and Mm -hmm. that we do know quite a few people who are familiar with the area. So this kind of touches on that. Okay. All right, I'm going to read it now. In the summer of 2023, my sibling was going to Vancouver to get his gender-affirming top surgery. He needed someone to take care of him while they recovered. He would need to stay in Vancouver for 10 days after the procedure in case there were complications, as well as to do a follow-up appointment to make sure he was healing well and there were no infections. I volunteered to go on this trip as his caregiver. The trip was basically covered by the BC federal government, so we had no control over where we would be staying. I wasn't going to complain about anything they chose because it was basically a free trip to Vancouver, and as a photographer, I was super excited about being in the mountains during early summer where everything was lush and green. We stayed at the Poco Inn and Suites, which, if you are ever out there, I recommend. (laughs) The staff are amazing and take really good care of their guests, and they were so kind and caring towards me and my sibling. It's a city that's about a 20-minute drive east of Vancouver called Port Coquitlam. We... Mostly me, as my siblings spent most of the time sleeping in the hotel, spent a lot of time walking around the city. There was a shopping area near us that had everything we could need. In fact, I'm pretty sure I was out there daily. It was such a beautiful town to walk through and explore. We even found a small ghost town within the city that's now used in television shows and movies, but that's a story for another time. Skip ahead to last week. I was listening to the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit when they mentioned that Robert Picton was now eligible for day parole. When they explained the crimes that he had committed, they mentioned that it happened on his farm in Port Coquitlam, which made me freeze. I knew Picton had committed the murders outside of Vancouver, but I thought it was a small town in the mountains, further east from where we were staying. In fact, I remember being on the plane and wondering if I had flown over where he had committed his crimes. Little did I know, not only would I be staying in the town he committed his crimes in, I would be staying roughly three city blocks from where his farm was and shopping within a block of the farm. There are a few things worth knowing if you're wondering how I could have missed a big old pig farm in the middle of a city. First off, the farm was basically destroyed sometime in 2002. In fact, there was a lawsuit from the Picton family against the RCMP claiming for damages. They claimed that the police had, and I quote, Demolish, remove, destroyed, or rendered inhabitable or useless various building residences, infrastructures, motor vehicles, stores, equipment, and machinery on the properties, which they called a loss of income and profit. Secondly, there is nothing that remains from said damages as the whole lot is condos now. So, Charlotte, I sent you a picture that they sent me of the condos. I want you to just take a quick peek at it. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, they go on to say, the city is really trying to tidy up its image since the Picton crimes in order to encourage residents to stay and feel safe. As a guest to their city, I can say they seem to be doing a great job. The town is full of green spaces, lush forests, beautiful parks, and loads of gentrified housing. I even walked past the Picton property on my way to get groceries and had no idea that it was there. I've always kind of wondered about that and where the sort of locations were, because as much as I've heard the stories over and over again and read about it, I've always had a hard time kind of visualizing it. But now seeing these like townhouses and condos and stuff uh, that are over the area, now I'm just thinking like that has to be some bad juju. (laughs) Right. And they're like gorgeous, expensive looking townhouses. I'm sure they're not cheap, especially knowing that it's in the Vancouver area as well. But I suppose that happens with suburban sprawl, right? Where one minute you're on an acreage or farmland or what have you, and the next the city is spreading out towards you. 
They finish off the email here by saying, so that's my story of how I was in the area where so many beautiful souls lost their lives at the hands of a monster. I wish I had known what I was looking at when I was there. I would have loved to pay my respects. I grew up on the east side of British Columbia and we heard about the case often. I've always been interested in it and I wish I could have left flowers or something to show my respect and show those ladies that they are not forgotten. That's a really kind thought. And to be fair, I would not have suspected the same thing if I was walking down that area. If you didn't know, there's nothing there that would indicate that something horrible had happened, right? The city has done a really good job at uh, kind of regentrifying it. <laughs> they definitely have. And I mean, the messed up thing is the average person that spends what I would assume is a boatload of money on one of those townhouses, which again mm-hmm. are beautiful, they're new, they're very nice. They're not going to know what happened there. And I would want to know Yeah, it's certainly not going to be advertised, and I would also like to be made aware of this sort of thing for sure. Yeah, because in real life, it's not like the movies where you get a massive discount on your house because it was built on a property where something terrible happened. These people are paying full price, and like, I would not want to live there. No, I think I would skip this one myself as well, especially at that price. Like you say, it's not the horror movie situation where it's like, wow, what a steal of a deal. It's these are probably one, two million dollar condos type of deal. Absolutely. And I mean, the Picton case is surrounded by injustice. This to me is just another nail in the coffin. Couldn't agree with you more. With that, uh, we're going to finish it off here today with a strange and unusual death. I've heard that this one is going to take us all the way back. Yes, we are going back to approximately 262 BC. All the way back. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about a fella named Zeno of Citium, who was a Greek philosopher. And this is a short one, but uh, it's quite a strange death. (laughs) Okay. So this fella died somewhere around the age of about 71, 72. We're not exactly sure. And uh, the wild thing about it is in his younger years, he actually survived a horrific shipwreck. Wow. Zeno was in Cyprus, and he was a philosopher, so he was at a school, of course, and he was leaving the school one day, and he tripped, and he broke his toe. (laughs) Okay. So he broke his toe, and he was angry, and he started striking the ground, and he was quoting a famous line saying, I come, I come, why dost thou call for me? And then he died on the spot because he was holding his breath. No way. (laughs) (laughs) And I heard this and it reminded me of Peter Griffin on Family Guy where he falls and he's just like, ugh. Oh, yes. Uh." Yes. (laughs) Oh, my God. That is the pettiest thing I've ever heard. I thought it was going to take more of a, oh, he, you know, died of sepsis because that seemed to be what got just about everybody in those days. Um but he held his breath so long that he died. Yeah. And you know what? Like a lot of these ancient stories, I'm sure there's more to it. Maybe he had a heart attack or something. Who knows? But uh, he broke his toe and died shortly after, after punching the ground. You know, today's episode was full of just awful, awful and more awful. So I kind of figured uh, I'd seal it up here with uh, a really strange death that, you know, we never like to laugh at these, but uh, that's a hell of a way to go. It does seem, historically speaking, that ancient Greek philosophers have gone out in some pretty unusual and sometimes spectacular ways, that's for certain. Yeah, we've talked about this a lot, but like back in the day, especially this is like back in the day, it was really (laughs) easy to die. And uh, this just shows that that is true. He was 71. That's quite an age for those days when 30 was considered middle-aged by any means. Oh, I'm going to be a total booger and I'm going to correct you on this if you don't mind. Oh, no, by all means. It is actually a huge misconception that people died in their 30s back then um, and in, you know, earlier years. People definitely died earlier. However, because the infant mortality rate was so high, it kind of skews the averages. So. 
people actually did live quite a while back in the day, especially in ancient times. Um, so 70, 71, I mean, that was quite old, but it wasn't necessarily super unusual. Okay, good to know. I stand corrected. And I'm sure quite a few people out there are also like, oh, okay. That was a fun little fact for you to tell at the dinner table tonight. Absolutely. That's just another little knowledge bomb that I can hide away in my brain. All right. We're fun dinner guests, aren't we? (laughs) Just always bringing down the mood and talking about morbid things. But hey, I mean, if you're new here, well, hello, welcome. We talk about grim things. But if you're a long time listener then uh, you know what you signed up for exactly <laughs> speaking of being a long time listener so we've got a couple fun things coming up next week for the regular show we are on to episode 99 Woo. so we've got a fun little palate cleanser for you all that uh, is pretty freaking cool I actually really like this story and then we are working towards our big 100th episode series that I I know you're excited I'm excited I know a lot of people mm-hmm. listening are excited we've had some guests I'm gonna say it right now it's not 10 Ted Bundy. Fuck no. And fuck <laughs> Ted Bundy. It is fuck not Ted, Ted Bundy. Bundy. Nope. If we ever cover that motherfucker, it's going to be a way bigger number than 100. Let me tell you that right now. <laughs> and we're going to complain the whole fucking time, too. <laughs> Absolutely. You are going to have to stick with us for a very long time before we talk about Ted Bundy. I don't know if that's an incentive or not, but here we are. You know what? We've got a big list. Like, those of you who don't know, Charlotte and I have a huge, huge huge list of different categories of episodes that we're going to eventually do. I'd say hundreds upon hundreds of people on there. And uh, he's not on that list. No, absolutely. He is not. And we add to this list all the time, especially thanks to a bunch of suggestions from you guys listening out there as well. But yeah, Ted Bundy, not a fella on the list and will not be anytime soon. So you're going to have to keep guessing for 100. (laughs) And I like the guesses, so keep them coming. So uh, if you have any guesses, let us know. If you have topics that you want us to cover on Extra Credit or the regular show, email us at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com. Or if you have a story like Cosplay Bug Yeg did, uh, I love hearing from you guys. I know Charlotte does too. So keep those coming. It's, It's fun to get to hear your side of things. And we did just very, very recently a, another Grim Encounters, Grim Encounters number five, in fact, and we did take it in a slightly different route. We contacted a couple of fabulous, fantastic, talented authors who were gracious enough to share their work with us, and we told some short horror stories that are absolutely fantastic. So you should go check that out, but if you do have a Grim Encounter story of your own, by all means, send it our way. And uh, yeah. Honestly, that was such a fun episode to do. I loved it. I want to do something like that again in the future because I love horror stories. I love horror shorts. And that one was just, oh, it was the stories that we covered. Again, if you haven't listened to it, go listen after this because I don't want to toot our own horn, but toot toot and toot toot to the amazing authors. When we do it again, not if we do it again, because we're going to do it again, because I had so much fun. Hopefully there'll be some video content to go along with it as well. So stay tuned for that kind of thing as well. Yeah, we're working on all of that. We have recently learned that as the podcast grows, there's a lot of like, I don't even know how to word it. There's a lot of stuff we got to do to keep this beast growing. (laughs) absolutely but it's so cool it's amazing um so the other thing to go along with that as always if you want to support the podcast in a really great way please check out our patreon that's patreon.com slash the grim curriculum we have recently updated it to uh have the tiers make a little bit more sense so you can support it for as little as like three dollars canadian or as much as ten dollars canadian if you want us to read your name at the end of our episodes which uh i like reading your names so let's uh, grow that list. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're also, of course, available across all the other social medias. We're on all major podcast platforms. Apart from that, I don't think we have anything else to tell you guys. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed today's extra credit episode. I know it was pretty dang gloomy, but that's what we do. And uh, we appreciate y'all for being there with us. Thank you so much for listening, guys. This has been the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. Credit.